In today's age of social media and instant information, it isn't surprising when news articles pop up of something terrible that a celebrity or internet influencer has said in the past. Sometimes this is brushed off as being something from another time when people weren't as sensitive. A lot of the time, the person will end up apologizing for what they said or did, and then other times the accused will double down on what they said, giving several reasons defending themselves. One popular reason given is they're just being edgy. They're just edgy jokes. It's just for shock value and outrage. And it is this last one that I'm interested in. Shock value and outrage. The idea that something said or done is so outrageous that it'll spread itself naturally because people will end up talking about it. They're mad, and they want to spread it because it's shocking. It can also be used to defend comedy. Laughter is a fairly common way to deal with uncomfortable situations, and shocking jokes have that effect on their audience. You usually laugh when a comedian says something that you wouldn't say at a Thanksgiving dinner. However, at what point does the initial value of shock begin to pass? When does the consumer become desensitized to shocking content? And how does apathy affect the relationship between consumer and product? Well, to talk about this, we're going to look at the OG shock man himself and France's greatest toilet paper novelist, Marquis de Sade. Sorry in advance if I mispronounce these French names. And, spoiler alert, I guess, for a book that's a 200-year-old smut novel? You may be familiar with Desaad if you've ever read lists about top banned books. He is frequently on that list, if not near the top, for his excessive displays of violence, sexually and otherwise. He liked writing about it so much that we even got the word sadism from his name. He wrote about it excessively, and trust me when I say that. One of his novels, Juliet, which Napoleon jailed him for, is like 1,200 pages long. 1,200 pages! It's only 200 pages less than War and Peace. That's so much smut that it put a Tumblr fanfic to shame. We are going to be looking at this topic through the lens of his most famous and probably most accessible work, 120 Days of Sodom. This is also the work that I am most familiar with. 120 Days of Sodom follows the illegal and morally abhorrent adventures of our four main characters, the Duc de Blanguet, the Bishop, the President de Crevant, and Dursit. The Duke is the closest to a leader of the quartet we get, an aristocrat who killed his wife and daughter to get his fortune. The Bishop is... a bishop. It's important to know that de Sade hated both religious and governmental authorities, and the Bishop and President are meant to be violent caricatures mocking those systems. The President is a judge who gets pleasure from unfair sentences, and Dursit is a banker. All four of these have their own proclivities, though if the title didn't give it away, sodomy is the main theme between all of them. Our four libertine scum end up kidnapping a whole host of men, women, boys, and girls before squirreling them away in a castle in the Black Forest during the winter for four months of 120 days of awful behavior. They get these people any way they can, from kidnapping, murder, blackmail, to straight up buying them. The four characters spare no expense in making their murder porn fantasy come true. They impose a series of ridiculous rules I won't get into, as well as a silly structure of the day for when people are supposed to eat, gather, what they can eat and drink, and then they all sit down for story time. A moment during the day where everyone gathers in a hall and listens to one of four old prostitutes recount sex stories. So, 120 Days of Sodom is conveniently split into four parts, with each part worse than the one that preceded it, and told by one of the old prostitutes at a time. This gives the novel a very natural progression from section to section, and makes it easy to understand when there is going to be a jump in extreme behavior. The parts are the simple passions, the complex passions, the criminal passions, and the murderous passions. The progression is interesting and could be a whole video itself, but what's important about these parts is that only the first is fully written. See, de Sade wrote 120 days while imprisoned in the Bastille before the French Revolution. He wrote it on a bunch of toilet paper and hid it in the walls of his cell because he was very determined to write his smut. 
Fortunately for him, and unfortunately for Louis XIV, the revolution happened, and he got free. So the other three parts are really just extensive notes because he forgot to grab his wads of toilet paper. Except for the last anecdote in Murderous Passions, which is by far the most violent and graphic scene in the novel. It is completely written out, and it is completely awful. So, with the scene set and the context given, how can we use Dessaud to examine the modern consumer's relationship with shocking content? Well, the four-part structure of 120 Days is integral to seeing how one can be desensitized to shock. Let's look at the first part, the simple passions. These are all sexual and deviant acts that aren't typical intercourse. For Dessaud, simple passions include a lot of poop eating, pee, and spit. It's a celebration of consuming fluids that really aren't meant to be consumed. One character even going so far as to talk about a friend he had who enjoyed eating miscarriaged embryos from young prostitutes. It's disgusting. At first, most people would put the book down after the great detail given on how to make someone poop perfectly for human consumption. But if you continue on past the first couple of stories, you begin to see a pattern. You begin to see the same words being used and the same sentences being rephrased. One of the most interesting things about 120 Days of Sodom is the fact that it even exists and, like I said before, the structure it has. This four-part build, this exponential growth in violence, its actual content, on the other hand, is... Boring. I found myself getting tired of the descriptions. You could only describe eating poop and other human waste so many times the same way before it stops being interesting. Before it stops being shocking. While the other parts of the novel are note form, except the very last anecdote, they have the same effect. Once you've waded through the simple passions, you've got a good idea of what you've gotten yourself into and the written notes of the novel are easy to read and digest. It is this act of repetition where 120 days of Sodom begins to lose its shock value. This constant barrage of words and phrases that you've grown accustomed to make it easier for you to read the next terrible thing. And then you get used to it, and then you move on. And then you get used to it, and then you move on. For me, the initial value of shock passed after the embryo anecdote. And once that line was crossed, it was easy to be desensitized to the rest of the novel because, well, if something's going to be that gross, there's a certain expectation of what's to come, especially considering that Dessaud just outright tells the reader what's about to happen. Even the gratuitous violence ends up turning into a kind of Saw-esque scenario where Dessaud comes up with more creative ways to torture and sexually exploit characters in the novel. This is not a highbrow intellectual examination of violence and its relationship with the characters. This is literally just torture smut. And at this point, the shock is long gone. It becomes easier to read 120 days, not because the stories become less gross, but because it becomes the same. And this predictive cycle makes the rest of the novel an honest chore to get through. It is easy to become apathetic when reading 120 days. And when that happens in the shock value phase entirely, it becomes the same. It becomes normal. So, when something comes up in the news, another famous person or influencer accused of something, or another tragedy happens, natural or otherwise, it is easy to feel the same sort of apathy that Dasad induces because it is just a repetition of events. Just as the reader begins to accept that this is how the book is, so too do we as consumers in the digital age begin to accept that this is how instant information is. And while we can pick and choose what we want to care about, it becomes hard to care about everything, because the value of shock has already been stripped from us. In the end, even Dasad himself became a staple when talking about violence or about pornographic novels. Sure, it took until 2017 for France to declare 120 Days of Sodom a national treasure. Interesting to declare a smut toilet roll a national treasure, but okay, France. But even the shock that Dessaud reveled in during his time and the shock that extended his fame after his death has faded. 
In 120 days of Sodom, there is a small crystallization of the type of repetitive and constant stream of information that we now experience through the media. The product, regardless of initial bizarre value, will eventually be viewed apathetically. This doesn't diminish the content. I still found the final anecdote of the novel to be horrible and gross, but it does change how the content affects the reader, which is to say, it doesn't. The emotional rise isn't there. And while some could argue that this is dangerous because if something is repulsive and vile, it should be rejected, and apathy makes it difficult to do that, I would argue that there is a silver lining. The lessened impact of shock makes it easier to critically analyze a situation and take one's own opinion from it. It makes it easier to look at works by Desaad and other authors inspired by him. There is, to an extent, some merit in allowing oneself to overcome the initial stun of a shocking moment and find something unique afterwards, even if it has been written on 18th century toilet paper.